one of the areas that had always intrigued me based on the age of these women and the fact that they're hit with the disease at a time of childbearing age made me consider a, a career choice uh, to study various aspects related to hormones and pregnancy and lupus. It seemed quite logical a thing to consider. And I was interested in both bench research as well as clinical research. And a young black woman came to me in the first trimester of her pregnancy and she had lupus. She actually was spilling a bit of protein, but I felt the rest of her disease was relatively stable and no therapies were initiated. And I noticed in her lab work that she had antibodies to an interesting target protein called SSB LA and also at SS, um, SSA Rho. And I knew from some reading that these antibodies were associated with the development of something called congenital heart block. It was rarely described. I'd heard very little bit about it. I discussed this with her with absolutely no idea then about what would be her chances of having this problem or if identified what we might do about that. As it turned out, I rarely take vacations, but my family always enjoys a vacation uh, skiing. And I was on a ski trip and I got an astounding phone call. And that was the patient calling me hysterically that the baby she was carrying had a slow heart rate and they weren't sure if this was the heart block we discussed. It was at 21 weeks of gestation. It was rare to find a person who could do a fetal echocardiogram at that time. And in fact, I flew back to New York. We had the hospital administrator drive us in a limousine to Columbia University to find the only echocardiographer in the city who clearly confirmed that this child had congenital heart block. The story doesn't have the best of endings at the beginning. The baby was born and unfortunately the young son succumbed to this problem at age one and I went to his funeral and I said to that mother, I hope that you'll get pregnant again because the research I've read into suggests that it won't happen on every pregnancy. Indeed, it was a happy ending. Her next child was totally normal and actually achieved his own stature in the Harlem choir. But I think it's these real life stories that in a sense direct a physician's thinking about what would interest them and how one could make an impact. And from there, um, NYU and the Hospital for Joint Disease was very supportive of my initiation or rather application to the National Institute of Health to organize data about this very rare disease. And from that time, and I would incidentally say that from a research perspective, the very first grant I received on this subject was from the Lupus Foundation of America. And I can't tell you what a thrill it is for somebody to actually give you money to study a disease. And knowing it's coming from donors is, is a pretty exciting um, situation and one for which you're particularly, um, in a sense, you, you, your stature and your consideration of the obligation that that imposes upon you really is something that's kind of hard to express. And that actually, in cooperation with the National Institute of Health, launched a, a career and a career for many individuals who've been working with me to study this disease. And we've come so far to even five abstracts uh, orally presented in this meeting uh, relating to this subject. And what we didn't know then was how rare the disease was. We know that now. It only affects 2% of women with these antibodies. We discovered a particular type of subset of antibody called anti row 52 which seems to confer a slightly higher risk we also learned that not every pregnancy subsequent would be affected by this problem. And we learned that that occurs in 18%, suggesting a search for the genetics that might have a factor. And we learned, of course, that the antibody wasn't the only problem. We learned that the pathogenesis would be complex and involved a whole series of events likely operative on the fetal side. We learned that the disease is not always benign, as evidenced by the first case. We learned that there was a significant mortality associated. But what we also learned had to do with the mother. Because here is somebody who, in my case, was a patient with lupus. However, we learned just the presence of antibodies alone could confer this risk. And so now women were calling that not only was their baby affected, but what did this mean to their health 
since we realized that many of these women can in fact be totally asymptomatic, which set into play a whole discovery as to what factors might make these women more apt to get lupus or Sjogren's syndrome. And so we've now learned that about 50% of these women, despite how high the titer this antibody might be, actually remain completely asymptomatic. But we've also learned that about 50% go on to develop a rheumatic disease. And studies are in place to try to use that little clinical pearl as a tool to understand why antibodies alone don't um, eventuate in lupus and what are other factors that might push it. We've learned many other things along the way. And that is, we've learned that fetal echocardiogram is an important tool to managing these patients. We've learned that there might be some early signs of problems that might possibly be amenable to therapy. But we've also learned, sadly, that there are no therapies to, um, uh, to ameliorate this disease once third degree block has been identified. We've learned that the spectrum includes more than third degree block. And we've learned that low doses of IVIG don't work to prevent the disease. But I think an exciting development at this meeting, in collaboration with Dr. Peter Ismerly, who is an active member of NYU, a junior investigator, quite interested in this problem, is that hydroxychloroquine may offer some promise for preventing this disease. And what's kind of interesting here is Dr. Ismerly is a translational researcher, came to one of our, our uh, Friday research seminars, and he was listening to the fact that chloroquine might have an effect on dampening a macrophage inflammatory and pro-fibrosing response. And he said to me, Jill, have you ever thought about asking in your registry, maybe hydroxychloroquine, which would have this effect of um, inhibiting the endosomal acidification, might actually be preventative. And I thought, what a great question. And it was exciting to see Young Mind taking our basic science and trying to bring it to the patient. And indeed, he presented at this meeting here at the ACR that when he looked at recurrence rates, and we've already said the recurrence rate is about 18%, he saw in a Obviously, it was um, not a formal prospective study. It uh, involved chart review and involved collaboration across actually the United States as well as France, Spain, and the UK, that the reduction with Plaquenil was about 70%. And this has really spawned our interest in obtaining um, funding in the future to be able to evaluate this potential possibility in the future.